All right, Gator fans, we are live. This is our Florida, South Carolina preview show. I am joined by Jamie Bradford, host of Inside the Gamecocks, the show. Jamie, let's go ahead and jump right into it. Thank you for agreeing to join me. Um, South Carolina, two and three on the season, but to be fair, has played one of the toughest schedules in the country so far. They've lost to North Carolina, Georgia, and Tennessee. So are, are those losses... Do they have you guys really a little bit? Like, how are fans? Are they hitting the panic button, or are they okay? Well, first of all, thanks, Allie. I appreciate y'all having me on, and um, it, honored to be here tonight. Um, it, fans are always reeling, right? You know, anytime <laughs> you lose a game, it's time for the head coach to go. The AD's got to go. Uh, you got to burn the whole thing down. Season are you ticket prices right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's called that's called life in the SEC. Uh, unless uh, I hate to say this, but unless you're at Vanderbilt, um, but, um, but yeah, so, you know, it, that's just, that's the nature of the beast and, you know, guys around here, you, we get it, everybody gets it and coach Beamer gets it. Um, you know, this is, we, we're in a sped up world, as you well know, you know, everybody wants it right now. And sometimes with the portal now in play and NIL now in play, you, you can make things happen a little bit quicker. Uh, then you used to be able to do that, but but not really at South Carolina. So it's still a process. There's some things that they have to continue to grow through. Yeah, they've played some some difficult in some difficult environments. Um, you know, I, I was there in Charlotte. That was a neat night. Uh, the day was great, but um, you know, you give up nine sacks, you should lose, and they did. And then you know, you go on the road. I mean, th to be honest, I mean, I, I say this word, and it and it sounds really strange when you're playing between the hedges in Athens, but they were dominating Georgia for yeah. a half and, uh, and it just was all clicking. And then they made the adjustments. Carolina didn't. And then same thing, you know, they were in the ball game early up in Knoxville and uh, Tennessee was really hungry to get them after what happened last year in Columbia. So, you know, it, get Carolina, just like Florida plays really well at home and they're hoping that that works to their advantage this weekend. All right. So coach Beamer has mentioned that he is not using last year's game as motivation, but you've got to think there's a little bit extra motivation in there for the guys after the way it went down at the, at the end there. Well, yeah, probably. I mean, I'll see Shane in the morning. As a matter of fact, we've got the Letterman's golf tournament and I'm planning to, to kind of pick on him about some of that. Um, but um, yeah, it's yeah. Anytime you get beat, especially in the fashion in which you got beat last year and like you think go, go back last year to that, that two week period for Carolina. What, I mean, there it was, was no wildest two weeks in sports go from that and then end your season, you know, when you beat Tennessee the way that you did, but you just couldn't show up in Gainesville. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. I mean, uh, I remember that every second of the ball game down there in the swamp and I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, Hendon Hooker in Tennessee are going to light up the night sky next weekend in Columbia, and this is just going to be a disaster. And then and then that happened. They hung 63 on them. So, I mean, you know, you, you but you you do take those those type games. They are motivation. I, I'm not sure that you make that a part of every conversation that you have Monday through Friday necessarily. But, I mean, it, it, a friendly reminder from time to time that you were thoroughly embarrassed on national TV down there last year. It's not a bad thing. So uh, will it be motivation? Sure. Is it the topic of conversation? Absolutely not. They're two and three, and they've got to find a way to win some ball games mm -hmm. to try to keep building where they want to go. And same thing with Florida. I mean, this game is it equally as important for both teams because of what's left on the schedule. Yeah. I mean, the schedule only gets harder from here, honestly, uh, for Florida anyway. But yeah. You know, we, we say it's the wildest two weeks that we saw in college football last last year, and it, and that's probably true. I don't know that I've seen a bigger contrast between how they played against Florida and then how they played the next week against Tennessee. Um, what do you attribute that to? Well, um, how much time do we have tonight? It's 8 o'clock, <laughs> right? 8.09. So, uh, you know, I can give you the short version of what happened, and then I give you the, the really long version. So I'll, I'll keep it pretty short and sweet. Um, they were, you know, offensively, that team was very capable with, with Spencer Rattler. He's, he's, he is a really good quarterback, and he's really smart, and, and they had a lot of talent around him last year. They still have a bunch of talent around him this year, although a little, little bit different up front in the running back situation is a little bit different as well. But, um, 
you know, they they had – you ever watch, you watch the Kentucky Derby, right, Allie? Yeah. All right, sometimes you got to know when to let the horse go. You got to know when to let him run. You know, and you'll and you'll have you'll have jockeys who you'll you'll get through the race. You know, you get through those two minutes, and, and at the end of that race, you'll hear the guys on TV sometimes on NBC saying they just held on a little too long. They should have let him go a little bit earlier. Should have let him go a little bit earlier. Mm-hmm. That uh, that offense in short was too complicated, and 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 you they were they were instituting two new plays every week. I mean, they couldn't run the plays that were in the playbook, Allie, and then that we're going to put two new plays in every week. Like we're going to go in there and. Uh, fake somebody out. They were faking themselves out. You know, I mean, I've got it on pretty good accord that, you know, Coach Coach Spurrier early early last year, you know, made a phone call up there and said, I don't know what y'all are doing on offense, but this is atrocious. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, when Steve Spurrier tells you your offense sucks, it probably sucks. So, you know, they, they basically went, went in there and they said, okay, well, what are the things that we do really well? Well, yeah. these are the things we do well. Okay, well, why don't we do that? In baseball, if you got a guy who can – who can throw a fastball and he can throw a breaking ball, but he can't throw it. He can throw a changeup, but it's just not really that good. And you get halfway through the year and, and you've been working on it. You've been working on it. And it's just, you know, it's, we'll just go back to the fastball and locate it and go back to the breaking ball and locate it and pitch, you know, quit, quit, quit worrying about a third and fourth pitch. So yeah. it's kind of the same thing in football. I'm trying to make analogies to simplify the conversation a little bit, but once they let him go, they let him go. And then now Dow Loggins has kind of come in. And he's brought that NFL mentality of, hey, look, man, I was actually in the NFL for 10 years, not as an assistant offensive line coach who tried to recreate everything when I became a, an OC in the SEC like the previous guy. Um, I know what it means to have a conversation with a quarterback. What do you do? What do you feel comfortable doing? What do you like doing? Here's what I'm comfortable with. What are the rest of the guys in this room comfortable with? Because if you go down, they, somebody else has got to play. Right. And let's try to figure out our, our playbook from there and – They've been pretty good about doing that. They've got some deficiencies on offense. So they've had to adjust some things, but overall, you know, it's it's not a train wreck like it was. It might not be scoring sixty points a game, sure. but I mean, there is a flow and there there is a, a a rhythm to this offense. But sometimes the other guy's just a little bit better than you are. And you've mentioned that up and down offense, but I mean, overall, Spencer Rattler at least has been pretty good completing 73% of his passes, nine touchdowns, three interceptions, 1400 yards passing. Tell me your thoughts on him this season. Yeah, he's been, uh, he's been really good. Uh, here's a stat for you. You know how many incompletions he's thrown in Williams Bryce stadium this year? No idea. Tell us four. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, he's been pretty special. Um, and you know, it's probably, probably pretty easy to get frustrated when you're a quarterback with talent, like, like he's got and, You've been sacked 23 times in six games. You know, at some point in time, you're wanting to grab somebody by the face mask and throw them up against a wall somewhere. Um, you know, I know down – like at Florida, you know, Mertz goes – gets sacked five times in the first game against Utah. I don't think he went down in the McNeese State game. And then maybe once. And then in the last three games, he's been sacked three or four times a game, right? I think three times a game. You know, it, there's a guy who's completing 80% of his passes. So, you're like, yeah. well, you, if you keep the guy standing upright, uh, you know, the ball's going to move down the field, right? Yeah. So, you know, same thing with Spencer. I mean, you know, not it, he's been sacked 23 times, Allie. He probably should have been sacked to this point 33 or more. I mean, there, there are times I'm not sure how he got out of there, but he yeah. did. So, you know, he's he's a leader. Um, he's He's got you-know-whats, uh, and, and, and he's – he just goes out there and he plays and he battles and, and he doesn't throw anybody under the bus. He puts it all on his shoulders and he gets right back to work. And uh, they're, they're really lucky to have him. He, he's a tremendous talent. And there's a lot, uh, you know, I haven't gotten to really know Spencer that well. Um, been around him a couple of times. Uh, know plenty of people who spend lots and lots of time around him. It, it's amazing. I, and I used to think the same way, so I don't blame anybody for thinking this. You know, what you would see in that television series and you would see – it, on TV coming from Oklahoma and just you you hear things that stuff isn't true like it, it it's just not I mean he I don't really know how to explain it he's a he's a really good guy and he's a really good quarterback and and like I mentioned <laughs> Carolina would be uh, probably one and four without him and right. it'd be it'd be pretty bad let's talk a little bit about your running game Mario Anderson has a better average, but Joyner has more touchdowns. What are your thoughts on the running attack in general? Yeah, it, so that's uh, – glad you brought that up. That's really interesting. Mario Anderson is probably – is not probably. He is the best running back on the team. Um, 
And uh, but Joiner Joiner sniffs the end zone, and, and he has since he's been at Carolina. He's a guy when he's in the red zone, he'll find it. Uh, he'll he'll find the end zone, and, and he can get you in there. Uh, he's done that as a quarterback. He's done that as a wide receiver, and he's done that as a running back. Uh, he's 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 played all three positions at, at South Carolina, which is really incredible. Uh, Mario is an interesting story. Mario grew up in uh, just outside of Goose Creek, really Somerville, South Carolina. Uh, which is down, you know, right outside of Charleston. Um, and he played at Stratford High School for a guy that I played played for um, where in my high school. Uh, so I knew Mario's story pretty well. Um, won't get into all the details necessarily, but put a long story short, he, he's got six siblings. And um, so he, he, he took the money where he could, and, and he went to Newberry College, not far from home, uh, D2 school up I-26. And um, in their version of the Heisman Trophy, and I can't remember what the name of it is in D2 for the life of me, but uh, he was he was one of the top three guys to win that award uh, last year. He ran for 3,500-something yards in, in a couple of years up there. Um, and in his off time, he, he, he wants to own his own barber shop one day. And in his off time, he uh, cuts hair uh, to, to help his, his mom uh, pay for the rest of his siblings for school supplies and things like that. Um, so he's a he's a very focused young man. We've done some NIL events with him. Uh, uh, in, incredible kid, and um, you know I think that the the thought was when he transferred in from Newberry, why why are they taking this this D two running back? This is the SEC. This guy doesn't belong. Well, as he as he it took him a while to, to kind of figure it out. Uh, you know, not just running the football. The ability was there, but picking up blitzes and understanding different protections and all these types of things. You know, protecting the football. They felt a lot more comfortable with the carry on, but you you just could this kid just you couldn't keep him off the field. I mean, he he was practicing so well, and so he finally started getting his chance, and and he runs a lot like a, a guy named Mike Davis used to run around here about seven or eight years ago, and um, all pretty happy there. Yeah, he he runs angry, you know, he runs angry, and and that's that's a good thing. He's got good vision, so you know his his reps are just going to continue to kind of stay where they are, if not increase a little bit. And to carry on, they're going to continue to get him the football, and, and he'll probably get the football in short short yardage-type situations down in the red zone. You know, they're not just going to, well, we're in the red zone, give the ball to carry on. That's not how it works. But that's where you'll see the bulk of his opportunities come from. Um, so they feel like they're kind of sorting it out there a little bit. Still going to be starting two true freshmen on the offensive line. And, and the, although those guys are very, very talented – uh, they're also young, and and yeah. so you know things are going to happen. But um, yeah, it's been an interesting case thus far, and and hopefully the second half of the season is going to be good to both of them. You mentioned uh, offensive line being young. Talk to me about the trenches on both sides of the ball for the Gamecocks. It's been a disappointment, to be honest with you. Um, T.J. Sanders has kind of come on on the defensive line. Um, I I like that matchup for Carolina this weekend there with with some of the issues Florida's had at center. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, TJ got a little banged up in Knoxville, but he's okay. He, he's going to be ready to go. And, um, so that should provide them a, a spark. Um, you know, they look on the defensive side, they, they do send a lot of people think that they don't send a lot of pressure. They do actually, they, yeah. they, but it's not very exotic. It's very vanilla. Um, that's probably something that they looked at hard in the off, in the off week wink, um, to try to figure out, uh, how they can, how they can kind of, uh, disguise a little bit more and, and, you know, like a game like this, you know, for instance, with Grant, Graham Mertz, he's a kid who got a lot of respect for him. I, I think he's had an outstanding start of the year down there in the swamp, but you, you know, if you, if you make it to where he's got to use his legs, that's a weakness for him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for, so for South Carolina, and it's not just Graham Mertz, it's almost every quarterback, the kid at Tennessee is the same way. He completes a quarter of his passes when he's out on the run outside of the pocket. Sure. And they they didn't do anything to get to him, so they they've really got to improve there. There's some talent on that side of the ball. Um, Jordan Strawn's an outstanding kid, but you know he's he's coming off of another knee injury from last year. He finally feels good at defensive end. Tonka Hemingway and uh, and Boogie Huntley are really good players. Um, last year Tonka had a pretty big year, I th but I think people are kind of this isn't disrespectful to Tonka. I think people are kind of starting to realize it was pretty good because. Zach Pickens was right there on the uh, defensive line. Well, he's starting for the Chicago Bears now, sure. right. you know. So, and he's a rookie. So, you know that, that that guy was pretty good. And and other guys can get better because of that. 
the offensive line has really, really been a struggle. They feel good about Vershawn Lee at center. They feel good about Nick Gargiulo at left guard. He transferred in from Yale. Believe it or not, you would think he's going to struggle. He's been the best lineman on the team. Um, that's that doesn't mean that they're all terrible. Um, had you if you had a better group in there, he'd still be starting. Uh, he's a really good player. They're, they're going to start Travon Ball at the right guard position this weekend. He's a true freshman, big kid, talented kid. Feels good about himself. I have no earthly idea who they're going to start at right tackle. So I'll just leave that there because that's been a problem all year. Could be Tyshawn Wanamaker. Could be Ja'Kai Moore. Could be somebody that sneaks into the locker room before the game starts. <laughs> I, I really don't know what to tell you, Allie. And then at left left tackle, Big Tree is what they call him. Um, uh, Bob Alade is his last name. He's from Maryland. They got him over Ohio State, and they got him over Maryland. He is a really talented kid. Um, he, he might have a bugabooer here on Saturday, here or there on Saturday, but he, he's a left tackle starting in the SEC. He's going to be really, really good. He's fun to watch. He's just young. So, you know, they're going to have a challenge with Florida's defensive line, especially that big old boy in the middle, 21. Um, you know, I don't know what their plans are for that kid, but uh, hopefully they're good plans uh, because if not, Spencer Rattler is going to have to find a way to get the ball out quickly. You mentioned a couple of minutes ago some adjustments potentially being made during the bye week. And I think one of the things the Gator fans are most concerned about would be adjustments or maybe wrinkles that Beamer would throw in on special teams with an additional <laughs> week to prepare for Florida. Florida has been uh, bad, honestly, um, on special teams this season. And, uh, you know, when you are playing a Beamer, you know it's something you've got to look for. What um, what have you seen out of special teams this season, and what do you expect out of special teams on Saturday? Well, it, it's not what it was last year. Uh, last year was really special on special teams. Um, they were the best special teams unit in college football. Um, you know, when you really take it all into consideration – I'll, to kind of circle the groups, Kai Kroger is an elite punter. I don't think, though, he's had the first five games that he really hoped he would. Yeah. Um, so that's – that's now they've, they've pulled a couple of fakes here and there. Uh, and, they, you know, they did something up at Tennessee that, that worked. And, um, you know, one of the things about their units is that's really unique. Pete Limbo's in charge of special teams. He's just – this guy is, is – Are you a dedicated special teams coach? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Right. Um, you'd be shocked sometimes what happens when you don't have 150 analysts uh, up in the booth somewhere and you actually put another coach on the field, huh. but I'm not taking shots at anybody. I'm just, just saying. Um, but, um, you know, Pete, Pete Limbo is a guy who, when he identifies it, they'll do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so here, what am I, what do I mean? Okay. Well, I don't know. There's 13 minutes to go in the first quarter of the game. You run down the field and you score and they see something that they know that they can they can exploit, they will go for two there. Now, yeah. it doesn't happen often because teams yeah. have kind of come around to preparing for it. But right. why can they do that? Because uh, their holder can throw it. Right. Uh, and their punter, when they go to punt, he can really throw it. Uh, Kai Kroger's seven for eight in his career with like four <laughs> touchdowns or something ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's outstanding. So – you know, that's generally where you're going to look for it uh, on, on the punting teams, um, on the field goal teams, on the extra point, you know, teams, the kicking teams. Uh, you're not going to see a lot of stuff in the return team generally. You know, they, they're, they're more they're, – where they're special in the return area isn't about being sneaky. Um, it's about uh, identifying matchups and identifying blocking schemes downfield that will allow you to break, break a big one. Um, and uh, so, you know – a couple of weeks ago, um, it was in the Georgia game, as a matter of fact. It, South Carolina, it was – what was the score at halftime? 14-3, to 3, I think, was the score at halftime. And the dogs come out and they go down the field and they score and they make it 14-10. to 10. Well, Georgia kicks off – the ensuing kickoff, Xavier Leggett, who's, who's certainly a guy that Florida's been game planning for in this sure. game, um, is, uh, is deep in the end zone and, and he catches it about four or five yards deep. Well, the large majority of folks in Garnet and Black are wondering, why is he bringing it? What are you doing? Why is this guy bringing it out of the end zone? Just take a knee and take it at the 25. Sure. Well, Shane, after the game, said, I'll tell you exactly why. Because 
we we put our our guys in a specific look on the return team, and we were hoping that the ball we we didn't care how deep it went into the end zone. We were hoping the ball would go to this side of the field where Xavier Leggett could get it because we were set up perfectly. He ended up getting tripped up on the 15 yard line, it, it, and so it looked like just a horrible mess for right. for Carolina. Is, sure, it wasn't. Right. They were one block, and he was gone. Okay. Right. And and they the whole thing was perfect. Matter of fact, Beamer said when they kicked the ball off, they said, "Oh my God, we've got it." We they were yelling at each other on the headsets, going, "We've got it, we've got it, we've got it." And 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 one guy whiffed, and um and so you know they'll take chances like that. Yeah. Um, they took a chance like that last year in the A and M game. Uh, thank God they did because they won that game thirty to twenty four, and Xavier Leggett took one one hundred yards in Williams Price. So, you know, it's not always going to be exotic, but they identify really well in the film room and that's where they have an advantage well you don't know this about me but my husband uh was starting punter at florida for four years so you just spoke to the punter's wife's heart right here okay all right <laughs> what year what years he was 2003 to 2006 so okay your year was our our 06 national championship team. so yeah yep yeah. and then and y'all were now were you in did you come up in 05 and coach Spurrier's first year did you come to columbia for um, that game well, in in uh, yes, I well, I didn't go. They went. They yeah, lost. I, I was at home buying the kegs, getting the party ready for when we were going to be clinching the SEC East. That didn't happen. Yeah. So yeah, that was that was a pretty wild day. Yeah, that that was a that was a wild day. All yeah. right. So if South Carolina wins on Saturday, what ultimately has gone right for them? Well, they – I don't want to say that they won in the trenches. Um, that, that might not necessarily be true, uh, but they didn't get – they didn't get whipped either. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that would be a start. They're going to have to – they're going to have to maintain their – both of these teams don't get to the quarterback very well, which is just baffling to me. Yeah. Florida has long been able to do that for decades, and – South Carolina, when they have good years, yeah. that's that's their mo. Uh, they're good up front. Um, both of them have talent, and and so you got to wonder why in the world that's been the case. But um, so they they need to be good there, and uh, and they've got to keep Spencer from having to flush himself out so much. He's going to have to be able to complete some passes. But one of the key stats in this game, if Rattler's thrown the ball forty times, they're they're probably Florida won. Um, if he's, as a matter of fact, if he's thrown it 35 times, it might be iffy. Uh, you know, this this is an offense where he needs to be able to throw it 25 or 30 times in the game. Um, they'll they they on the defensive side of the football, the, the the fear that I think most knowledgeable South Carolina football fans have, if they know anything about Florida and their style offensively and what can affect the Gamecocks defensively. This I'm not saying that this is a bad matchup, but it absolutely could be if you don't shut it down because Florida can Florida's a death by a thousand cuts type offense. Mm-hmm. And I know Gator fans are, would really like to see, you know, flying it down the field again. And I don't blame them. Um because that sure was sure was fun to watch unless it was on against your team. But um but in, in the Napier offense, the 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 Mullen offense, I know all the offenses under Coach Muschamp. Um, and, and gosh, we could name a lot more, but those have been very frustrating. They've been for, for Florida, but in saying all of that on a good day, it looks like a good offense and, and South Carolina some from time to time will, you know, sleepwalk through about three quarters of the ball game. And they'll look up and realize that the Gators, you know, have just chip chopped their way down the field. Um, and, and you've done nothing to stop them and it, and it can be very, very frustrating. So they have got to find a way to prevent the the uh, second and manageables and the third and shorts. Um, you're not going to be able to do that all night, right. but but they, they've got to minimize that uh, and try to maybe force a turnover or so, uh, a turnover or two. And speaking of turnovers, the, the, one of the more startling stats I've seen in college football this year. I was doing a lot of prep, you know, throughout the week, kind of on our program. I cannot believe Florida has only forced two turnovers in six games. I'm telling you what. It doesn't make any sense. What are they? What's going on? Do they not want the ball? I mean, what what are they doing? 
Yeah. Uh, they're, they're struggling with turnovers and they're struggling with getting to the quarterback that uh, for yeah. a defense that honestly has played well this season and has, I think maybe exceeded expectations with Austin Armstrong. Those are two categories where they just are not winning week in and week out and is where we uh, need to see some improvement for sure. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it's, this is a tail. this game is a blue collar middle-class game in the sec. You, you got two of those in the East this week. You got this one and you got Missouri and Kentucky. Yep. And uh, unfortunately for Florida fans and for South Carolina fans, somebody actually has to win the Missouri Kentucky game. They cannot both lose the game. Right. Um, you know, although we'd like to see all of us would like to see both of those teams just, you know, pack it in for the rest of the year. Um, so, but both of these teams, uh, I, I think, are playing for the rest of the year. That I don't like making statements like that. I think they're ridiculous. Uh, but you know, these must-win games. You hear people say stuff like that. I think it's a little overboard and a little outlandish at times. But, but I know what the expectation is in Gainesville. You don't have to be a Florida fan or cover the Gators or play for them to understand the expectation. The expectation down there is to play for the SEC championship. Yeah. And and if you play for that, you got a chance to go play for the national championship. They ain't been doing that, and right. and and they sure uh, we know it up here, and we understand that uh, Florida sure as hell ain't happy losing three years in a row to Kentucky. Um, they don't like losing to South Carolina. They don't like losing to Vanderbilt like they did last year. You know these are all teams that they've been beating for years. They don't see any reason why they should be losing to them. Missouri, uh, and and I under, I understand that if they get beat this weekend, the rest of the schedule doesn't set up well for them. Same thing for South Carolina. You lose at home to Florida. You got to go to Missouri. You got to go to A and M back to back, and you you will beat Jacksonville State and Vanderbilt to open November. But then you got Kentucky and Clemson, and you, you feel like if you can't beat the Gators at home, mm-hmm. you know getting another eight or nine wins is not going to happen. So, you know, both of these teams have a lot on the line on on Saturday afternoon. It's going to be an outstanding atmosphere, homecoming, the fair for God's sakes, in town, and all this other stuff. Um, and, and two teams that um, won't be playing each other every year after this year. So whoever yeah. wins this will will go out, I guess, a winner, I guess, if you want to say that. Uh, you know, I honestly hadn't even really thought about the fact that they won't play again, but that's true. That is uh, – this is well, – Not every year. Not fun every year. That we won't get to see every single week. Uh, also loved that you referred to our offense as death by a thousand cuts. little Taylor Swift <laughs> reference in there. Uh, all right. Yeah. Before we let you go – Sure. Go ahead and give me your score prediction. Well, I, I you know, this is going to sound very homerish. Uh, it's not. Carolina plays well at home, and Florida's lost 13 of their last 14 outside of the swamp. Uh, mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, until you see a team like that turn it around, it's hard to pick them when they go right. on the road. Um, and so I, I do think that, that Carolina will end up somehow winning the game. I'm not sure that it won't be, you know, something fairly ugly like what we saw back in 2017. I don't know if you remember anything about that game, but it was ugly. And somehow South Carolina pulled it out. They threw a interception out of their own end zone. Then Florida ran it down, was about to score, fumbled it on the one-yard line. We picked it back up and ran it back out. And Coach Mush, I was looking at Coach Muschamp, I was like, yeah, that's, that's, that's about right. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Kind of fits the bill around here. Right. Um, so I, I do think that because South Carolina is at home, it's another sellout. Um, Coach Beamer has had this team ready to play. They're a different team in williams Bryce Stadium. I think that's going to be the advantage. I'm not sure that it's uh, – you know, Spencer Rattler included in that, uh, by the way. I'm not sure outside of that it, it's really because of some big mismatch that the Gamecocks have or something like that. I don't think that is. If this game was being played in the Swamp, I, I, would, I would pick Florida. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, but I do think that Carolina will, will find a way to get it done. What my, my hunch tells me that they'll open the, the game playing really well. You'll look, you'll look up if you're a Florida fan and you'll be down something like 14 to nothing and 14 to three. And you're, you're going to be, don't, th- don't throw the TV, uh, the remote of the TV just yet. Just wait. And then all of a sudden you'll look up in the third quarter and it's 17 to 13. Yeah. And it's like, you know, the Gamecock side, we, we thought we were going to put these guys away. Right. Couldn't put them away. Florida just kept chipping, just kept chipping. That Billy Napier offense stayed on the field. It, it kind of would grind them down. South Carolina on the defensive side, not a ton of depth over there. Talented kids in the secondary. Uh, there's no doubt. But up front, just not a, not, a, not a ton of depth. Some, not a ton. 
and all of a sudden they're they're just grinding down and grinding down, and then maybe a mistake or something happens late where where Carolina can do uh, what uh, Mario Cristobal chose not to do, which is take a knee and, and get out of there. <laughs> All right. Well, Jamie, we so appreciate your time. I could do this all night long. This was an awesome conversation. Tell everybody where they can find your work. Yeah. So our, our program inside the Gamecocks, the show is part of our network. It's uh, called the Chief Sports Network. You can download our app in your phone, Chief Sports, and um, it's free. And we've got it's, it's a growing we're doing something nobody's ever done before. We're, we're just kind of getting started with a lot of this stuff. Um, but, um, but, uh, if you download chief sports, you'll see what I'm talking about. And, uh, I do, I will tell you one of our main partners is, um, uh, one of the greatest brands of bourbon I've ever had chicken cock bourbon or chicken cock whiskey. I'm actually having one on the air because these aren't FCC rules. So it doesn't matter. Exactly. And, um, uh, so, uh, if any of you drink that, please support those guys on our app, but certainly I really do appreciate you and TJ Alley for inviting me anytime and, uh, and we'll return the favor here, here pretty soon. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Well, yep. uh, may the best man win on Saturday. Yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes the best one doesn't win. Oh, that's true. That's, that's the true. thing. That's the thing. But uh, I won't, we'll just be the guy. I hope everybody has fun. How Very about good. that? Yeah. All right. There thank you all. Go. See ya. Thanks for joining us, Jamie. Yep. And thank you all for tuning in. Make sure you hit the like button. You can support the show with a super chat as well. Uh, guys, I loved whoever commented that Napier should hire me as special teams coordinator. I don't know that I have the time for that, but uh, that would be really, really cool. Um, and my phone is on. He knows how to find me. So, you know, aside from videoing, video content and things, I'll just go ahead and be the special teams coordinator. I want to share some thoughts on this game with you guys. But first, I want to take a minute to give some love to prize picks. A lot of you guys out there have been depositing and using the code PEEK, which is P-E-E-K. But even more of you have signed up but haven't yet actually deposited money. Go fix that right now. Use the code PEEK, P-E-E-K, on the prize picks app. And they are going to give you a 100% deposit match up to $100. Y'all, that's free money. You can select any sport or league to pair with another. So if you want to take Mertz over on passing, and then let's say Damian Pierce's rushing total on Sunday, go for it. Again, peak, P-E-E-K on the prize pick app. And good luck this weekend. All right, guys, let's talk a little bit about this game. The Gators are traveling to Columbia to take on the Gamecocks week seven. This is the 44th meeting between Florida and South Carolina, the 22nd meeting in Columbia. And as Jamie alluded to, this game is not going to happen annually anymore after this year. So kind of a big one. The Gators want to go out on top. Um, Florida has a gauntlet the second half of the season. In fact, they play the second or the, excuse me, the number one hardest schedule during the second half of the year, according to football power index. So it doesn't get easier from here. If Florida can't figure out a way to beat South Carolina on the road, it's going to be hard to be bowl eligible. After the bye, they play Georgia in Jacksonville, obviously the number one team in the country. Then they will come back to Gainesville. They'll get Arkansas at home. This is one I think they can get. It's a blackout game. Florida plays really well in the swamp. Then though, they head to Death Valley. They take on number 22 LSU. That is one of the very toughest places to play in the country. It is going to be a battle. Then they travel to Missouri where Florida just doesn't usually play well and they haven't for, you know, a decade. And then they get number five FSU in the swamp to end the season. So obviously this game is at home. We, we play better at home, but Florida state is the number five team in the country. They're a great team. That's going to be another hard battle. So getting a win on Saturday is going to go a long way to helping Florida get the six wins that they need to be bowl eligible. It's a big one. And We've talked a lot on this channel about Napier's road woes. His Gators are one in seven since he was hired as head coach, but only five and 12 on the road since 2020. So this has been a problem for years. As Jamie mentioned, 13 of the last 14 on the road are losses. We've got to figure out a way to turn that around. I'm going to tell you some of the areas that I'm going to be watching, some of the key battles that I think could determine the outcome of this game. I really think a lot of it comes down to Florida's defense. Can Florida's defensive line 
get sacks. This is what we just talked about with Jamie. USC has given up 23 sacks in five games. That's the fourth worst out of any Power 5 team in the country. It should be an opportunity for Florida's defensive line to feast. And honestly, for whatever reason, Florida's defense, even though they have been good this season, they have improved, they haven't been great at getting quarterback pressures or sacks. We need that to change. Spencer Radler is really good when he has time. He's a smart quarterback. He can make plays with his feet. He can hurt you. But he really does turn into a completely different quarterback when he's facing a line that can bring the heat. So if this defense can figure out a way to get pressure on him, they can force him to make mistakes. And that's what we're going to need on Saturday to be able to beat South Carolina. Another area of the defense that I'm really going to be keeping my eye on is the secondary. They have to cover Xavier Leggett. We talked a little bit about him. He is South Carolina's number one receiving threat. He really had a very, very good 2022. That's rolled right on into 2023. Third best wide receiver in the SEC in receiving yards. He has 606. And he's number one in yards per per reception in the entire conference. He's just shy at 19 yards per catch. And our secondary is pretty young and they have been decent this season, but they have given up a few big plays. And you know, that is exactly what South Carolina is looking to exploit. They are hoping they can catch Marshall or somebody else sleeping and they can burn him for a long ball. And so that's going to be something I'm going to be watching really closely. Can Florida secondary cover Xavier Leggett? He's good guys. And then, you know, as much as we know South Carolina is worried about their offensive line, I'm still worried about ours. And against Vanderbilt, we were able to play decently and establish a decent running game. Johnson and Webb were back there. They really played pretty well. And now ETN is going to be back in the lineup. So the Gators are going to be looking to build on what happened on offense last week. The running game was able to be established. The offensive line was serviceable. That is going to have to continue. It is Williams Bryce Stadium is a really loud stadium to play in. It's a hostile environment. Can this offensive line play as a unit? They're still going to be kind of a hodgepodge line put together. They need to avoid procedural penalties that have killed them in previous games. I would love to see Johnson and ETN on the field together. I think that look will help this offensive line. I think that will open up some wide receivers. So interested to see what happens there and, is Arlis Boardingham going to have a big game like he did against Vanderbilt? He really stepped up and he really, I think, improved the offense. He had seven catches for 99 yards, two touchdowns. This is just another weapon for Mertz, which he needs, right? He has Pearsall. He has Wilson. Having a third option he can count on makes this offense more potent. I'm really interested to see how he does this week. If last week was, you know, his coming out party, will it continue? All right, guys, every week I tell you some things that I need to see. I need to see this offense be semi-functional. Just talked about Borningham. He was a bright spot last week. I need to see if that continues. I need this defense to continue to improve. I feel like I've said this every single week, but they have got to bring pressure. They have got to sack the quarterback. And then special teams. I also know this has been on my list every single week. But when you are playing a Beamer, it is even more important that you emphasize special teams. Napier made a comment this week. He said, you know, Florida's going to have to be perfect on special teams. Well, they're certainly going to need to be able to count to 11 every single time. They had an off week. South Carolina did a bye. They for sure drew up some kind of crazy special teams play, and they are chomping at the bit to use it. Florida needs to be able to sniff it out and stop it. All right, guys, it is time to make a prediction. But first, I want to give some love to Meldon Law. They are the official injury firm of the Florida Gators, and they should be your official injury firm as well. Hopefully, you're not going to need them anytime soon, but if you're hurt or injured in any sort of accident, let Meldon Law take care of you. They have offices in Ocala, in Gainesville, in Lake City. So if they can be of assistance to you, contact Meldon Law 
and let them help you. They've got social media. You can reach out in uh, on their website. Lots of ways to get in contact with them. Let them help you. And then also make sure you go to their Facebook and enter to win tickets to their Florida, Georgia giveaway. We will link that in the description of this video because I want somebody that follows this channel to win. All right, guys, it is prediction time. I think the Gators win 27 to 20 in a close one. They put up some points. They break the curse on the road and they're on their way to bowl eligibility. Thank you guys for tuning in tonight. I appreciate you all a ton. I enjoy doing these every single week live. I'll talk to you guys soon. Go Gators.